next speaker is Therese Taylor, I believe. And Therese is going to talk about the Syrian gay girl blogger, <laughs> the politics of a cyber hoax. <laughs> studies um, on uh, memoirs and fake memoirs and the creation of the false self. <coughs> yes, of course. There we go. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, exactly so. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, today I want to um, uh, talk to us about the um, Syrian gay girl blogger, which was a um, hoax in um, which emanated supposedly from Damascus at a time when the media was beginning to take a great deal of interest in Syria in around 2011. And this was at the time of a growing <coughs> insurgency and calls for regime change in Syria. And the media at that time um, very much needed um, voices from Syria that would reflect their own point of view. Um, at that point, almost magically, um, a a uh, blogger from Damascus um, started up a widely circulated blog um, and it was the work of someone called uh, Amina Adela um, who was part American, part Syrian, had returned to Syria and was becoming caught up in the de democracy movement, was a creative writer, um, was a member of the gay community and was a very media friendly character. Um, the blog, as I say, was widely circulated, including on authoritative sites on the Middle East that would refer to it. Um, the blog was a mixture of um, factual reporting and some creative writing, and was greatly praised um, for its fresh approach. I can't tell you how many people really read the blog. Um, as, as a matter of fact, I had to read it um, for doing my studies on it. And it was, it's an awful blog. <laughs> um, it's, um, uh, one of the most dreadful things about it um, is that she adds poetry. And, <laughs> and, and the, the worst poems that we've ever written, the bird flies free, knowing no boundaries, borders mean nothing when you have wings. My heart and my soul long to follow and soar out over mountains and deserts and seas. And that poem goes on verse after verse after verse. Oh, uh, after I read her poems, I always have to um, go and have a lie down. <laughs> but they were, you know, very popular in their way. Um, of course, most of the blog was um, connected to um, the Syrian situation, the evils of the regime, and the good nature of the demo democratic movement, which was rising up against it. Um, there was a great need for such a voice in the sense that it prevented such a, consulting such a blog prevented you from looking any further. And the blog quite skillfully 
um, elided the violent nature and the foreign nature um, of the right, movement for regime change in Syria. Um, and of course it was all written in English, which, and no matter what I think, <laughs> on the style of the poets, etc., uh, written by someone who's obviously an, uh, first, has English as the first language. Um, that's an example there from the blog, um, that's from May uh, 2011, Why We Fight. Note that Why We Fight is a reference to American culture, and there was a famous series of propaganda films during World War II by Frank Capra called Why We Fight. Um, the, and um, the blog is full of references like that, which will cue immediately um, to a Western audience. And she talks about torture in Syria. She always claims to be an eyewitness of all sorts of various scenes, which are always described, however, in vivid language, but without any authenticating details. She says, it's what all of us expect that's to be tortured. It's why we keep our nails as short as possible so they can't be pulled off. It's why we were slow to come out into the streets. It's why there's little crime here. It's why there's little crime in places like Syria and Jordan, is in case someone tortures you. <laughs> and it's why you don't see so many women in these protests. Now, isn't that clever? Uh, because the lack of women in the protests was an early indication um, of the Wahhabist agenda. But um, they've got a much nicer uh, record there. She was also the gay girl blogger, and I will return to the question of what this sexual message is meant, the gender politics involved in that, and wrote about all her very, you know, very sexual counters and being an out woman in Damascus, and it was awful because it was more of these frightful poems. <laughs> and my sex and your sex grinding in time with sounds of the city stretched out below, etc. <laughs> um, whoever wrote this um, does not have any future in the very lucrative field of erotica. <laughs> it's awful. And as a matter of fact, when you read these sections, um, you sort of notice something about the gay girl part. Um, to start with, none of these women are all gay girls. They're not dogs. They're, they're a male fantasy of what a lesbian is. They're all these slender, long-haired girls embracing on a terrace in you know, Damascus. They're not like the women that you would actually meet if you were interested in uh, the gay scene in places like a man or Damascus, where you would find yourself um, among a group of women, not one of which lay, weighs less than 100 kilos, um, slamming Arak in a game that they play, <laughs> etc. You don't, you don't get anything crude or distressing like that in the Gay Girl from Damascus blog. And that's one of the first hints uh, to start with that she knows that she wants to write about lesbian sex but doesn't seem to know a lot about it. <laughs> this is uh, one of the indications that maybe there's something else going on. Um, she talks with more fluency about her youth when she was a student in the US and things like this, and again, the tone is sentimental um, and of a poor quality of writing. I was a teenager here, saying if I could go back in time, I'd tell my younger self not to be who it is that she thinks everyone else wants her to be. I'd tell her, you know that girl you like, tell her about it, the worst thing, she'll reject you and you'll live on, etc. And if you try that, even on the editor of um, a teenage girl's magazine, they'd, they'd send it away and tell you to polish up your writing. However, this is, as I say, um, a blog which is getting more credence by the day and is being followed by people and being referred to people who express um, concern about Syrian human rights questions were often indicated, including by scholars of the Middle East University, to follow this blog, which is pretty disgraceful. Um, the tone of the blog, all throughout, is apolitical. Um, the gay bill in Damascus makes the point that she is against foreign intervention in Syria. <coughs> Um, and she comments cynically on US policies where they um, support um, various retrograde regimes in the Middle East. She also comments on the Israel-Palestine um, conflict ostensibly as a supporter. Now I put up the writings on the Israel-Palestine conflict just to point out what is wrong with this voice. Um, there's several things here. One is that it is profoundly reactionary. Um, another is that it is not authentic to the Middle East. Um, in May 2011, 
There's one idea that drives the Palestinian struggle. It isn't about killing Jews or jihad or being inspired by Hitler or Stalin or bin Laden or whatever the haters claim on Fox. And it isn't about the holy cause of Islam or the struggle of the Arab nation or even occupation like they say over in Algeria. Religion has nothing to do with it. Nationalism has almost nothing to do with it. It's all about the return, al Auda, as we say. It's about the refugees going home, not to a state called Palestine, but home, a particular house in a particular village to gather olives, oranges from particular trees and live in the street. It's about living as you want in your own small space where your ancestors died and breathing the air that they exhaled and knowing that your children's children's children will be looking after the same trees when you're remembered, etc., etc. This <laughs> extraordinary <laughs> um, thing actually um, it is worthy of analysis. It is picturing the Palestinians, for one thing, as perpetual peasants. Um, the idea that it's not about nationalism is very interesting. It's about an atavistic return to the past. Um, and it's, as she says, it's simple, but maybe you have to be a Levantine Arab to get this. Oh, wow, the conversation <laughs> burns. Um, and of course, if, the truth is, if you're a Levantine Arab, you would never have written that. Um, it's, uh, it's, a very, it's very fake and it's very offensive. Um, those of us who've studied uh, studies on nationalism will see a very strong resemblance there um, to writings about um, Irish nationalism by the English. Uh, English nationalism was um, positive as state building and forward thinking, and Irish nationalism was the stubborn nostalgia of the peasant people for the past. <coughs> and that is what we see in there. And on the other side, a single idea grows everything. What then of Israel does the Gabriel? It's about autonomy and having a Jewish state, the Jews and Stark in Herzl's title, a state where Jews collectively would have control of their own destiny and set their own standards, where they have a refuge and a flag and a seat at the table, a state, an independent state, as Jewish as England is English, was the phrase I recall. And that doesn't mean an autonomous region in a bigger country or a non-sectarian, secular, democratic, unified state or a self-governing millet. Golda Meir explained it to Emir Abdullah, we didn't come all this way just to sit in your parliament. <laughs> No, they didn't. And they didn't come to rob the Palestinians of their patrimony either, was it? They came for solid, reasonable, intelligent and understandable reasons. Note the difference, the solid, reasonable, intelligent and understandable, and note the romantic pack about the Palestinians. To be free, to escape persecution, to be masters of their own destinies, to flourish just like everyone else. Indeed. Um, everybody reading that, as I say, should really have um, thought very carefully about who might be really the author of this blog. Um, and it was a bad show in a lot of ways. One thing about it is this. Some Palestinians read that, got right up their nose, and they started making inquiries about who was behind this blog. That's more about the Palestinians and the idea of a two-state peace is conceivable, but unfortunately the nature of the peoples, especially the backward Palestinians, is the problem, etc., etc. So, about Syria, when we, um, the Israel-Palestine conflict is still a very good litmus test um, for putting all voices for the region up against. It gives you a pretty clear idea of who is on what side. Um, the gay girl blogger, of course, is touting a future for Syria. Another Syria is possible. The new Syria will be a better place for Kurds, it will be a better place for Muslims, it will be an even better place for communists. And one thing's becoming clear, we don't with dictators and rule by strong men, no more generals, etc., etc. We've learned to respect one another even when we disagree. It's so tragically false because, of course, this is a period in which um, a huge amount of um, uh, bloody dissent is driving uh, conflict in Syria, including between the opposition groups themselves. And Syrian Salafis, they are as likely to take power here as they are to do with Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing keeping us from freedom is fear. Nice note there, that's not to Roosevelt, etc. Um, another Syria is possible and we can see it from here. Well, this is self-evidently nonsense. Um, and screens like this went up on the blog. While there really is nothing that I have been able to find, unless it's buried in those dreadful poems, um, which is authentic descriptions of the massacres around them. 
uh, it is extraordinarily lacking in a sense of place. And yet I've often seen um, people who esteem the blog say that that was what drew them to it. And they must be missing it, that it's not there. They don't, uh, for some reason, it's this thing that you don't, if you expect to see a thing, you will find it and you don't notice its absence. Um, aside from having no specific details about Syria, you know, not, none of that kind of thing which a normal person puts on their blog saying, at last we're having strawberry drinks again, this is the height of summer, etc., etc. Not even things like that, which you could do if you've got a proper guidebook. <laughs> um, she didn't have anything like that. Um, she had some monstrous errors, which I think only an English-speaking person with no familiarity to Arab and Islamic country uh, culture would have. Um, oh, sorry, I'm going ahead. Um, just use the scroll on the mouse to we'll go back. back. Yeah. Look, look, look. There you go. Oh, you go back here. Um, made a whole series of errors. She wrote a post called Still Sunni After All These Years. Again, note the reference this time to um, a famous top song by Paul Simon. <laughs> and she says that she um, believes in God, etc. And that's why I call myself a Sunni, not for sectarian reasons. She says, though I bear a name that marks me as damned by birth to some, but for reasons of my belief, I reject the idea of a special people having a special access to God. I reject the notion of popes or imams who are infallible. I reject will I to a fake. I reject the notion of priests and prelates needed to mediate the experience of God for ordinary people. I believe that all of us men and women are capable of comprehending the advice, etc. etc. Uh, that's a nice extract. It combines kind of hate-filled sectarianism that would be very offensive to a lot of Shias and a lot of Christians who read it um, with an assertion of her own identity. But she's made an extraordinary error with this thing that she says that her name, Amina, is a name that marks me as dead by birth to some. And that's stupid. Um, the name Amina is not, <laughs> it does not have any pejorative associations in any sect of Islam. Yeah. And it cannot have, because it is the, the name of the Prophet Muhammad's mother. Oh, yeah. It's a very common name in all sects. What she's got is she's muddled the name Amina with Aisha. Uh, the name Aisha oh, is not favoured by Shias. Um, if you meet someone with the name, with the name Aisha, they are most probably Sunni. Um, just like if you meet someone called Bernadette or Trace, they must probably be from a Catholic family. Um, mm. And she's got Aisha and Amina mixed up. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and that's like, as an error, that is just like incredible. Um, uh, as I say, Amina is a name used in respect to vocal support. I'll just put Amina Asada in there, um, a noted um, Shia Muslim writer from Iraq. Uh, she really was, um, really was an Arab, really was a writer, really was arrested and, and disappeared. <laughs> um, and uh, wore the name Amina. Then, on the 6th of June, uh, a fateful day in the Middle East, it's the um, anniversary of the Six Day War and also of the invasion of Lebanon. Um, it was announced. Um, oh, two things came on the blog. There was a widely circulated blog post, uh, My Father the Hero, where she claimed that Syrian security forces had come to the house to arrest her. Um, they were the usual boneheaded um, Assad thugs. Um, they were full of anti-Semitic insults to her and anti-gay rhetoric, but her father drove them off with his noble um, defence of freedom. And they were so ashamed they left without arresting her. This post, my father here, you'll still find it all over the internet, was widely repeated on all sorts of um, blogs and posts, thus showing how terribly ignorant people are. I, the coverage of the Middle East, um, as our two very able previous speakers have shown, is so inaccurate that if you read too much of it, you end up knowing less, not more. <laughs> and that's how they mistook that for My Father the Hero as an authentic post. I don't have time to pull out all the gender implications, etc., and cultural things, but it is, uh, uh, it, to put it mildly, um, it's very colourful and improbable, and it's written in a clumsy rhetorical style. Um, it was followed shortly afterwards by the 6th of June Post, which announces that Amina has been kidnapped, uh, apparently by security forces, off the streets of Damascus. And the disappearance of the gay girl in Damascus was reported in the international media, and it was the lead story uh, in the British Poultry Corporation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, the British Broadcasting Corporation, who um, um, announced this awful event. <laughs> Thank you.
babysit our religion. <laughs> um, and this is the picture that was circulating um, as Amina. Um, as someone who has um, written a great deal about hagiography of the saints, I find that an entirely typical picture. It's of the passive woman, and note the averted gaze, which is for studied admiration. Um. And a very strong aspect of many of these representations of women is that the world looks at them and they don't look back. Because you couldn't really call um, this fakiness blog a um, form of communication. <laughs> and then... <laughs> And the annoying stories on the BBC, who should have just left it, um, meant that a whole lot of people um, started to look for the real origins of the person that was writing the blog. And it uh, attracted the attention of several people. The first um, was the Book Maniac blog, a very small, a small blog, um, by a woman who does a, a lot of coverage of gay women's writings. And she said she was troubled about the Amina blog because it greatly resembled the previous hoax that she had uh, been involved in, where someone called Owen Solly had been running the plain Jane blog about a bisexual woman who was a victim of sexual assault, and he turned out to be a middle-aged man. <laughs> and she said very tolerantly of Owen, this is Owen Solly, is that his real name? Um, he was fun, fun to be around, as well as being a good writer and superb online performer of identity. Uh, his late stories evolved later into a novel, The Mexican Year, which were, by the way, about a Muslim woman. If you read all three of these writing projects, you may see some stylistic and thematic similarities with Amina. And the um, book review blog, Book Maniac, was getting very, very good point there. She said that only being able to point to these stylistic similarities wasn't very strong evidence. In fact, it is very strong evidence. Uh, like a lot of women, she's selling herself short. She then got involved, uh, she then linked up to the Let's Get Real blog. Uh, Let's Get Real blog. <laughs> oh dear, I can't get it. It was another um, gay blog, uh, but, but um, in the West. And it had been featuring um, special writings um, from Gay Girl in Damascus. But the editor of the Let's Get Real blog, who at one stage had a passionate online relationship with Amina, had a falling out with her before she disappeared off the streets of Damascus. And the editor of the Let's Get Real blog was so annoyed by this that she allowed book maniac uh, blogger access to the emails that she had got from Amina. Mm. And the, if you get the original of an email, you can get a whole lot of information out of the header including from where it has come from. And it turned out that this had never been rooted through any surf in the Middle East. Uh, in fact, they were directly linked um, to an email account at Edinburgh University. <laughs> so we're starting to, yeah. Um, so and the editor of the Les Real blog, Paula Brooks, had other issues with Amina that had some sort of spite. Uh, she said, you know, um, gay women have such um, high ideals and such passionate feelings towards each other that they have these feelings out all the time. That's so funny um, because it also rebounded on the editor of the Les Get Real poem. I love it called Get Real because Paula Brooks was in fact a fake identity created by Bill Graeber, a 58 year old man. <laughs> and he's right. Um, and it always caused a great deal of consternation. Oh, all these men doing Perhaps if you'd been only, this is in 2011, if you'd been only two or three years later, perhaps these men would have passed themselves off as. Um, taking part in some sort of transsexual thing. <laughs> that was still, still not the thing back then. And it just appeared to be something halfway between fraud and wow. mental illness. <laughs> and they were sadly denounced by lesbians, speaking with the authentic voice that you don't find on the gay girl blog. And as um, one of the uh, people put on denouncing the Les Get Real blog, um, she said, um, they, she said that men have to leave them alone. She said they can take their dicks and leave. <laughs> she said, dicks are gross. So are men. <laughs> and, and that is exactly the kind of thing, as I say, you never read. It's very distressing to read. Um, anyway, well, um, outing the Let's Get Real um, editor uh, was the activity of some people, and other people were getting onto the rather serious issue of who was behind Gay Girl in Damascus. And 
Um, various, uh, another writer um, tried, uh, who, who does a lot of coverage of um, the, the Arab revolutions, etc. Uh, he went through Twitter and he, what he discovered was that no one had ever spoken to Amina in person. Again, this was negative evidence, but it was rather compelling. And then, on the 12th of June, only a week after the announcement of the arrest and the huge media outcry, while there is a huge campaign going on, Facebook had got 15,000 members in a single hour, etc., to free Amina. Um, on the Electronic Intifada blog, the Palestinian blog, um, the editor Ali Abu Nimar and Benjamin Doherty presented their evidence, uh, which showed that uh, the Amina Araf character is closely linked to a postgraduate student at Edinburgh University, an Anglo-American called Tom McMaster and his wife, Brittina Froiker. And um, Tom McMaster's um, links to the blog are multiple. There were things like private emails sent to the blog's author contained photographs identical to pictures taken by Froiker and posted on her page in the Picasso photo sharing website. Um, at one stage, Amina had been running a discussion group on Yahoo Group some years back. Um, and Yahoo Groups requires that you put in an address um, when you put in as administrators, and it was his address which could be traced to him um, through great records, etc., etc. Um, uh, the Electronic Intifada crew did a devastating job in a short time, and McMaster did admit um, to being a Syrian gay girl blogger. He said, the narrative voice may have been fictional, the facts on this blog are true and not misleading as to the situation on the ground. <laughs> this experience has, sadly, only confirmed my feelings regarding the often superficial coverage in the Middle East and the pervasiveness of new forms of liberal orientalism. I can't believe you said that. <laughs> You're talking about yourself, man. Um, yeah. <laughs> however, I have been deeply touched by the reactions of readers. And he's lucky to have been out of reach of some of the readers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, what's exposed? Um, the media uh, then went into a sort of cover-up mode. Um, the Washington Post, which is a great peddler of fake stories about the Middle East, it's almost a, a point um, of connection between many of them. Um, said, if McMaster had not been so emotionally resonant, so detailed, so seemingly real, nobody would have cared much when Amina disappeared, and nobody would have worked so hard to figure out what might have happened to her, and nobody would have learned that she was a pale man from Georgia, which meant that at least in a chilling and narrow definition of what it means to be real on the internet, McMaster was very good at being Amina. And really, I mean, uh, perhaps I haven't been fair, I've only shown you some extracts from the blog, but wouldn't you say they were emotionally resonant, detailed, and seemingly real? Of course, there was something wrong with the voice I was using in reading them out. Yeah. <laughs> um, on the 11th of June, when doubts about Amina um, were beginning to circulate, um, the BBC ran a story stating that Amina the gay girl blogger might not be real. And this was some uh, time for them to cover their positions. And they described her writings as compelling stuff, but is it true? Mahmoud Hamad, a Syrian rights activist in London, is inclined, inclined to think so. This is a quote from the BBC's um, article. Her level of writing, her sophistication, her intricate knowledge of Syrian society, as someone who doesn't know Aisha from a minute, um, and what's happening right now politically in Syria compels you to believe that this person is actually a genuine political activist and homosexual, he told Newsmart. Um, I don't know why he thinks that he can um, define uh, who is and who isn't um, a gay woman, but there you are. He thinks he can. <laughs> But not every, but he admits that she could be a man, a group of individuals, or anyone really. Um, nobody, Mr. Hamad knows, has ever met Amina Dodd in person, and all contact with the blog has been by email, he says. Um, it's interesting that the BBC would put up with such a shitty, shitty excuse um, of a story, obviously trying to cover up their own credulity. And who is this Mahmoud Hamad, whom they are quoting as a Syrian human rights activist? He is actually, I. I find him again on 27 October 2015, he has a byline, he's a BBC Arabic producer, so he's a member of their own staff. Uh, he's not an independent voice at all. And I did not see um, any of the news media who gave e extensive coverage to this hoax um, ever live up to their journalistic responsibilities and look at the story in detail and admit to their failures. Um, well, since then, there's been a couple of a 
couple of analysis um, of this case. And I myself hope to um, publish something on it myself in the future. Um, a filmmaker called Sophie Deras re re released a film, um, a documentary film, A Gay Girl in Damascus, The Amina Profile, in 2015. Um, the film was largely about her own online relationship with Amina, and they used to have uh, lots of emails and all of this. And um, the, the film gets so much into her personal story that it tells you very little about the political and national context. Um, and it is largely reconstructing her personal story of love, loss, and betrayal. She doesn't think it's funny, so she's not like me. She's not. She has a tough Australian sense of humor. Um, Distant Witness, um, a book by journalist um, Arnie Carver. He discusses the Amina hoax, and he was one of the first people on Twitter uh, to be reporting doubts about her identity. Uh, and he describes uh, basically just going through all his contacts and trying to find someone who knew her and finding it a bit strange that no one did. And also the fact that um, Syrian gay activists privately contacted him about the My Father the Hero post, uh, pointing out the utter improbability of the whole thing. Mm. However, um, neither he nor anyone else published these doubts until she was outed as a fraud. Mm. And I can understand that um, because um, there's the, sort of this terror that you're... Um, in attacking an innocent and already oppressed person. And I do think that um, male writers um, have a justifiable, a, a bit of sense of um, the, the, the gender gap that they shouldn't be um, unfairly attacking the woman's voice. Um, apparently woman's voice. Um, another analysis of the Syrian gay girl blog is by a British blogger, Bethany Rose of the Milk Teeth blog, and she looks at it as an example of a simulcra. So she's taking a Derridian literary analysis. And the simulcra, what it is, is um, it's um, a copy of something which is so perfect that it supersedes the original, often crowding out the original. And the simulcra um, is a, a problem of our time because um, we live in a world of advertisements and representations, etc., um, which often alienate us from real experiences, and simulcras are, are bad examples of that. Um, and the Milk Teeth blog points out very fairly that um, Mac uh, how Macaster took pictures of a Croatian woman that he found online and presented them as Amina. Um, and there's so much she said about that hoax. However, in relation to the similar from uh, the appropriated image and the press attention are later outrage. Um, is they show how an American man's opinions on what a Syrian girl should look like is more important than any actual Syrian girl. <laughs> and here we're reminded of Camille's argument that the simulcra is not a copy but an alternative. That if people of colour, particularly in the third world, are not doing, suffering poetically or photogenically enough, they'll be replaced by a simulcra. And I think that's very true and a very good point. Um, my own analysis, I don't exactly follow that analysis, I think it's an excellent, excellent point she's making. Um, I think that the best way to look at gay girl in Damascus is in studies of propaganda. Wartime propaganda has features which are now infiltrated in many aspects of news coverage and entertainment. We are in many ways a society suffused by war. Uh, one of the characteristics of propaganda is that it works on received ideas. It also exalts innocence and peace, but in terms which allow the inf infliction of the most extreme violence in order to protect them. There's a scene in the play by T.S. Eliot, Murder in the Cathedral where St Thomas of Becket is tempted by a demon who arrives after all the other temptations and he says, I'm only here, Thomas, to tell you what you know. And he sketches several glorious features and St Thomas says, I thought of these things. And the tempter says, that's why I tell you, your thoughts have more power than kings to compel you. And the poet is pointing out here how the articulation of our own thoughts appears extremely real and has a rhetorical power which makes outside realities quite weak and distant. Like the demon in Eliot's play, the wartime propagandist is always telling us what we already know. So such images are beguiling, they free us from the arduous effort of understanding other people and other contexts, and instead we're entertained by the manifestation of our own subjectivity, which takes on the guise of a reality beyond us. This is a reflexive pattern of my understanding, we understand others through ourselves, and it's the reason why the girl blogger was gay. In our world, sexuality is essential to identity, and self-actualisation through erotic desire is a key aspect to our culture. Since that's true for us, it needs to be true for Syria as well. And it's not only true, but it's the opposite of the truth. 
The opposition movement in Syria is actively hostile to the forms of sexual expression and choice which Western culture deems essential to individual freedom. And that wouldn't be a problem if it, uh, they have to lie about it um, in order to drum up a level of support um, for this project. The inversion of reality is alarming because it indicates that in believing this source, readers will be drawn into believing a whole series of consequent notions. It begins with the readiness to support a freedom of a non-existent ideal Syrian citizen. It progresses from there to a political and military intervention to, to a sovereign nation, which is known through a series of fantastic images. Now, the Syrian gay girl blogger uh, might appear to be an unusual thing, um, but as a matter of fact, it is part of a whole field of hoaxes. There are many, many literary and media hoaxes, and they appear to be becoming more common. Yes, there's him. Um, uh, as far as literary hoaxes are concerned, I will mention the 1995 example of Benjamin Wilkomorski, um, a Swiss man. His real name is Bruno Dosica, but it was too sad, unromantic for him. He became Benjamin Wilkomorski, survivor of the Holocaust. He wasn't a survivor of the Holocaust. He wasn't in Auschwitz as a child. He was a Jewish. Um, but he wrote a memoir, Fragments, in 1995. It led, and Fragments... Um, won several awards for Holocaust literature, despite the fact that the Holocaust must be one of the most studied academic topics in our time. Um, it's very ludicrous that they're so easily fooled. And here is, I think, um, a level of credulity, a level of expectations of so-called true and memoir literature that will meet our expectations, which seems to be almost out of control. Um, and um, Wilka Mirsky's uh, memoir had several um, aspects of improbability, most notably, and this links us to um, the media's new um, blogger from Aleppo, the Twitter feed of the little girl, uh, the banner. Um, it, it's, it's, it's ludicrous to speak of a child of um, three or four, etc., having the kinds of developed thoughts that are pre presented in those texts, as was presented in Wilkomorski's memoirs. Um, however, uh, he was everywhere fated. He toured the United States and was greeted by a woman using the name Laura Grabowski. She also was a child survivor of Auschwitz, or so she said, and she recognised Will Kamersky. They've been in the camp together. They used to go on speaking to us together and play musical instruments. They were um, uh, both talented musicians. The BBC, who else, <laughs> recorded a concert <laughs> held at the Beverly Hills Synagogue on April the 19th, 1998, Holocaust Remembrance Day, in which Will Kamersky played clarinet and Laura sang an original piece, Ode to the Little Ones. Who on earth is this Laura person and why is she remembering Will Kamersky from the camp if he was never there? Uh, well, she was never there. She was, um, that was an assumed name. And under her previous name, she was a, had written a very um, lucrative memoir about being a survivor of satanic sexual abuse. Hmm? Uh, I just mentioned that Will Kamersky case because you might think that um, the gay girl from Dem Damascus um, meeting up with the Les Get Real are both fictional characters. Uh, you might think one faker um, hitting up against another would be all, an almost impossible chance, but in fact there's quite a number of such cases if you start to study fake literature. Well, leaving Will Kamersky where he is, a um, out-of-work ex-Israeli journalist um, who's visiting Switzerland uh, looked into his case, um, found about 100 things wrong with his supposed identity and outed him, and so he was, um, his book has lost all prestige. Um, but it is a very good example of the kind of fake which is so easily accepted. Um, here we have the voice of Holmes, Danny Abdul Dayem, the 22-year-old British citizen. He's a British citizen of Syrian descent. He therefore spoke excellent English, which is a very important thing with these fakes. And he was at one point uh, a citizen journalist from Holmes, and he was the voice of Holmes. But in March 2012, uh, Syrian Danny, the voice of Holmes, was hastily retired from his media career because Syrian state television um, got footage of him setting up scenes where he's supposed to be in a conflict zone and he was actually directing people um, to fire the weapons etc to make um, a good background for himself and um, that uh, as I say destroyed his credibility that's a simple um, to going back to 2003 an example from Iraq a woman called Jamana Hanna was promoted as being a unique voice about Saddam Hussein's regime of terror. And she was supposedly um, someone who had been held in prison in Iraq. 
um, severely tortured by the danger same person and then somehow survived to enter the green zone and tell the Americans the truth about Iraq. Yeah. Uh, she was from the Assyrian Christian minority and spoke reasonably good English. Otherwise, the Americans couldn't have understood her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they didn't understand her well enough, though. Um, in this room, here's a little test. Who among us has heard of the widely prevalent rumour that Uday Hussain was a rapist? Everyone. Yeah, 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 yeah. he's widely known as a rapist. Um, and yet, one doesn't quite know where one's heard that. It's from her testimony. Um, he apparently uh, raped her when she was a virgin and all this stuff. It was a very lurid story. Um, she was an excellent witness because, for unlike most Arab women, she was willing to testify in explicit terms about sexual crimes. Do you see something similar there with the gay girl in Damascus, a person willing to breach discursive norms um, which are normally in place in that culture? Um, the ridiculous thing is that um, what I, I don't know um, what O'Day Hussein was like. I mean, I have no objective sources of information about him. He never met this woman in his life, um, so he certainly didn't write. But I think it, it was again, it was a very unlikely story. The president's son doesn't torture his own prisoners, just like he doesn't iron his own shirt or cook his own dinner. <laughs> uh, he's got people to do that for him. Um, however, um, Jemana Hannah told a very good story and she was um, uh, various American judicial figures who interviewed her, who should have been on point about looking at witness statements in a critical way, were utterly credulous. Um, uh, Gerald Burke, who was an American uh, case, said it was a perfect case, someone coming forward with our worst expectations of what the regime was like. Um, there again you see how his expectations have been met by her. Uh, occasionally we would even say to ourselves, if this is a con job, then she deserves to go to the United States or even Hollywood, and I suppose so. Uh, in 2005, her story was debunked by Sarah Solovich in Esquire magazine. Um, Jemana had not even been a political prisoner um, in Iraq. She was, in fact, in prison for a short term on foreign prostitution charges. <laughs> Uh, and then was released and then made an absolute fortune um, out of her contacts with the United States, uh, to which she eventually left and moved to. Um, what conclusions do we draw from this? Uh, well, there's a couple of others as well. That's um, a quote from one of the Americans who interviewed um, Jermaine Howe. Isn't that extraordinary? Um, he says he's been in so many countries taking testimony about many atrocities. New Jersey Superior Court judge. He should, as I say, be much better at evaluating testimony. I have to tell you the mm -hmm. bonus story between the most compelling and tragic other than yeah. <laughs> I think that there is a tragic story in yeah. her life, but it's not the story she's telling. Yeah, sure. And of course, in 2003, here in Australia, we had a visit from um, a Jordanian lady who wrote a memoir about her best friend who was a victim of an honour killing. Uh, best friend was a Muslim. She herself was a Christian, Norma Khoury. Uh, Norma Khoury um, entertained us all speaking to us in English with an American accent. I actually played um, a small role um, in um, the Norma Khoury hoax. I went to a public um, reading by her and I wanted to speak to her but she didn't seem to want to speak to me. <laughs> Even though I was so nice. <laughs> reading to her in Arabic, a language which she seemed very unwilling to speak. <laughs> and, um, and I wanted to ask her um, about the area from downtown Oman where she allegedly lived, uh, but she couldn't, um, she got very angry and couldn't tell me anything. And um, her bodyguard asked me to live. Norma Curry was in fact um, from Chicago. Um, she left the United States in um, 2002 to come to Australia. Um, her book was put out by the publishing house Random House. Uh, or published as an authentic memoir, despite widespread scepticism in Jordan. Um, a, Jordan a Jordanian woman, um, Mrs. Al Sabag, uh, looked into the background of it and finally found out Norman Curry's real name by a whole series of steps that I won't go into here. It's a very fascinating story in itself. She managed to get uh, in contact with an Australian journalist, Malcolm Knox, who then took up the story in Chicago and fitted the various pieces of her life together. And at the time when these events were supposedly taking place, um, she was in um, Chicago and in fact was being investigated by the FBI for financial fraud when she got a visa to come to Australia and present herself as the author of this book. 
there's something going on there um, about um, government to government corruption. Um, some extraordinary. Uh, as with the Syrian gay girl hoax, you can sense the presence of the intelligence agencies. They're only one step away with the political hoaxes. Um, Norma Khoury, um, as with Jamal Hanna, um, was, um, had a, a background in fraud and had that ability of con arms to sum up their audience. They were also very good at seeing who isn't, who isn't a threat and avoiding them. Um, she had um, a background of um, a fractured family and sexual abuse in her childhood, which is um, really awful, um, but of course does not um, excuse this kind of fraud in society in general. Um, but the main, I think, responsibility of this lies with the publishers and the people who are putting these people forward. And Sawad Brule Vive also came out in 2003. It is um, a French language memoir. Um, by a supposedly Palestinian woman, and I um, wrote an expose of this. I went um, all the way to Jordan and to Switzerland to look up the background of it. Um, and um, Sawad is um, supposedly a survivor of a non crime in the late 1970s and was brought to Switzerland by an organisation called Tear Des um, I questioned every aspect of her story, and my writings on that memoir are online. And I just would say that it would be impossible for any fair-minded person to look at my protect and think it is an authentic memoir. And yet it is um, freely circulated and indeed is often recommended in French schools um, for uh, people interested in women's rights in the Arab world. Most unsatisfactory situation. Um, well, on conclusions that we draw from this is simply there seems to be a lot of fakes. Um, further, there's very little resistance to such fabrications in the prestige media. Journalists of, journals of record are not very fact-checked. Um, the voice of the oppressed is favoured. Women and children first. There are male voices here, but they're rare, and they'll always be a vulnerable, youthful male. The critique of the fake always comes from the margins. When these fakes are exposed, it's always from a small online journal, or from someone like the out of work Israeli journalist who went to Switzerland to follow up Will Kamersky. Um, or me, <laughs> teaching history in a rural Australian university, and I published my article about um, uh, Brulee Viv in a small um, journal called The Diplomat, etc. Um, it's a platform which is demonstrably distant from the circles of privilege, whereas the places where these um, faiths are favoured is in places like the Washington Post and the BBC. Um, the standpoint of the outsider is both why they can perceive the fake and why they are willing to say so. Now the fake, although it appeals to a facile anti-authoritarianism, is always closely aligned to hierarchies and structures of power. The fake speaks to us in our own language, literally. There's a huge resistance to reading subtitles. A person who wishes to be an authentic voice in the Middle East has to be able to deliver their message in English or French. And this links to the position of the audience, who are granted enormous power by fakes. They can demand to be entertained by reality and to pass up the effort of understanding others through contact with the contingent world. The fakes use the structure of human rights, which is defined as non-political, to push a political and indeed an imperialistic agenda. So my final word on this is, this is politics with the politics taken out. A narrative which has fluid descriptions and intriguing involvement of fiction while having the serious and even deadly purpose of fact. <laughs>